In the last video, we discussed the prelude to the final confrontation, at least for now, in the Siege of AR-558. If you haven't, go ahead and check the video in the top right corner, because if you don't watch it, it's going to seem like I'm glossing over things, and when you comment, I'm going to point out I've already discussed that. As we talked about, the Starfleet Garrison was in dire straits. Subspace mines that would kill randomly and indiscriminately, severely undermanned, outgunned, and lacking any real semblance of morale. And on top of that, a recent scouting mission had identified where the Jem'Hadar were true, but it resulted in the death of the second most senior officer, Lieutenant Larkin, and another Starfleet officer, Nog, would lose his leg. So now they had even more wounded to care for as they had to fend off the Jem'Hadar. There has been quite a bit of criticism on Starfleet when you consider the situation the officers were in. A lot of people point to this and scoff as Starfleet apparently didn't have any form of Marines or know how to conduct ground combat. While I think this is probably an issue on the writing, and yet another example of how Starfleet was a very poor military, allow me to present a possible explanation of what we see here. We know that when Starfleet took the base, they were 150 officers strong. It is possible that most of these officers were, in fact, Starfleet Marines. It would make sense when you consider you land roughly 100 Marines and 50 Starfleet personnel. The Marines would be in charge of protecting Starfleet personnel as Starfleet tried to break through the security of the subspace hub. The Starfleet personnel would be mostly engineers, but you would have some Starfleet security there as well to back up the Marines and deal with the more mundane issues of the base. That way you have the Marines on the front line and Starfleet in a supporting role. When AR-558 became a hotbed and Starfleet could not reliably provide support, then you would slowly see the frontline elements, the Marines, chipped away, one by one. As stated before, Chintaka was never solidly within Federation control. Resources were tight. There wasn't an area of Chintaka that didn't badly need men and technology. So when everyone is screaming how they need emergency supplies, then, ultimately, everyone is on an even scale when it comes to who gets it first. And the hub might not be given as much priority as you think. They hadn't cracked it yet. And even if they did, there was no guarantee that they would get anything. It was a maybe. There were real gains in Chintaka, and other places were moving forward on their fronts. This hub might help, but it might not. It was a risk, and one apparently Starfleet wasn't willing to make a huge investment in. And they would be proven right when Chintaka was taken only a few months later, and the hub had yielded nothing. So seeing Starfleet soldiers in normal Starfleet uniforms and most officers without knives and a severe lack of what you need to survive a confrontation like this can all be explained away if you consider that the garrison had been so heavily attacked that anyone who knew ground combat, used camouflage, or knew how to use the tech to survive was dead. Again, there are some holes in my theory, but it seems the most reasonable. As we had discussed before, there were two issues, the Jem'Hadar base and the subspace mines, also known as Houdinis. Starfleet engineers would ultimately be able to identify where the Houdinis are. Additionally, they did find out and know how the Jem'Hadar would attack the base. So they did the most logical thing. They got the Houdinis, and they placed them in a spot where they would kill Jem'Hadar. And they would kill as many Jem'Hadar as they could. One thing I did like is there was an interesting moment where Starfleet officers would question the use of the Houdinis. That it was an evil technology that only the Dominion would use. And I love the moral questions in this. Again, it goes back to talks before. The Dominion was evil to the Federation. Ruthless killers that used genocide and subspace mines to exact their order. But in war? Real war. Total war. The Federation was no better. And they were about to prove it. In more ways than one. So the Houdinis would be reset in the ravine so that they could kill Dominion soldiers. Not Starfleet. Let's go ahead and move on to the tactics that were used here. The Dominion base was on one side of the caves, and the Starfleet garrison was on the other. The Dominion would have to pass through a ravine and then run at Starfleet full throttle in order to overrun the garrison and take it. Let's address a few of the issues I've read that people have with the episode. Why not set up force fields to block the Jem'Hadar? The Dominion has been known to be able to bypass Federation shielding. They could beam through shields, walk right past force fields, and treat most tech by the Federation to stop them as if it didn't exist. There was no guarantee that the ground force field would be as effective as ship shielding. Additionally, setting up force fields would take time and people. We don't know that they didn't try this, and the men sent out were just killed. Why not either side use transporters? We see the Defiant crew beam down. Well, we know that the transport scramblers exist, and it would follow that engineers would find a way of identifying frequencies to allow allies to transport down, but not enemies. Both sides could be utilizing this technique, which would mean transporting was out of the question. 
Additionally, both sides were using scramblers that made scanners go wild. So in theory, you might be able to use technology to secure a small area where you could get a lock. But outside of that, you'd just as easily rematerialize inside of a rock than in a safe area. What about grenades? Again, we know that there were 150 men originally. Perhaps they had used up all of these reserves and the Defiant didn't bring any more. Now, about the phaser rifles. Why not use wide beam? At first, I was like many. Why not use this? When I watched the battle again, not five minutes ago, I saw the folly in this tactic. Let me say this. Federation ground technology is idiotic at best. The phaser rifles are terribly, terribly inept. They have a slow rate of fire in comparison to Dominion technology, or hell, even a Tommy gun, and they had a huge energy drain. Additionally, in another episode, we see Kira discuss how touchy they were, so sophisticated that they could easily break. And then, the terrain the Dominion was coming from had a lot of nooks and crevices to defend them. So even if we assumed you could have a wide beam set to kill, or a wide beam stun that would work on Jim Hadar, the first wave of Jim Hadar might get hit, but then the Dominion would just duck behind something and let the energy get used up. The setting was a massive drain. They couldn't use it too many times before they would have to use their power packs, and during that time, the Dominion could get closer. No. Straight kill setting with single beam fire was the only way the Federation had any chance of winning this battle. Why wouldn't the Jem'Hadar shroud an attack? This one isn't as easy to really determine. We know that they had to use resources to shroud, that they couldn't just do it because they wanted to. So if I was a betting man, I would say that the Jim Hadar had similar resources restraints as the Federation did. After all, resources being at a critical low goes both ways. Neither side could really resupply often, so they simply didn't have the ability. We also have to consider how many Jim Hadar they were fighting. Two columns. That sounds like a lot, except it's not, in that two columns isn't a number. It's a formation. A column is also generally used in movement operations and not attacks, because as far as I can tell, it's walking in a line. They weren't doing that obviously, and again, two columns could, in theory, be just six guys in a Humvee. I tried to look for Alpha Cannon to try and find out how many Jim Hadar may have been at AR-558, and I really couldn't find anything. We know that the two columns were supposed to be significant. We know that the Houdinis would take a large swath of them out, and we'd still see a lot of Jim Hadar. For the purposes of this conversation, let's say they had two companies comprising three platoons each. This would give them in excess of 260 soldiers, outmatching the Federation 11 to 1. This would, to my mind, justify how hopeless it felt when Sisko found out. Now onto the battle itself. It's really curious watching the soldiers before the engagement, talking among each other, how nervous they are, how much pent-up energy there is. For someone who has never been in the military or in a combat situation, it certainly felt like something that would occur. Though how true to life it was, I couldn't tell you. And then, in the distance, they would hear the Houdinis starting to go off, one by one. The bright flashes of the bomb signifying the death of one of the Jem'Hadar, if not more. A life that was bred to die in a war they ultimately would not have even gotten into, if not for their superiors. And then again, silence. It's interesting one of the soldiers would hope that the Jem'Hadar had turned back, or that they were all dead. But of course, the Jem'Hadar wouldn't be and they would begin to rush the Federation forces. Even with the Houdinis, the Federation forces were significantly outmatched. Within minutes, the Jem'Hadar would breach the Federation lines, and fighting would occur both within the line and the Jem'Hadar still rushing forward. To call it chaos would be an understatement. It would be ultimately hard to tell what was happening or who was winning. It would quickly devolve in hand-to-hand -hand combat with fists, using your rifle as a weapon, or even knives. Starfleet officers would fire on a Jim Hadar to save their friend, only to be shot in the back and fall to the ground. Dead. While we can't be sure, it's a very good indication that the entire garrison was overrun and Starfleet had lost control. Again, I've never been in combat, but it would make sense to me to put the wounded in a secure area as far away as reasonably possible from the fighting. We know that the Jim Hadar had access and were running through the base, as Quark would have to turn and use his weapon on a Jim Hadar who made it that far. As an aside, Quark had done a speech about humans without creature comforts, something we'll dedicate an entire video to soon. And when his back was against a wall, when his nephew and his life were in danger, without even thinking, he grabbed a phaser and killed a man in cold blood. Now this was completely justified, it was self-defense. But it's very curious to consider his actions here and his opinions on humans. We don't know everything that happens in the battle because it cuts out when Sisko is knocked out. It's ironic in a sad way 
that Cisco is awoken to the words, are you still alive? But it's true, most people were dead, very few were still alive. Cisco would wake up to moans and crying, he would look as his friends would be cradling dead Starfleet officers, other friends who were now gone, for a hub that they hoped would work, would help, and ultimately wouldn't. The lives on AR-558 would be lost in vain. As far as I can tell, the subspace hub never gained any edge, and the Chintaka, along with the hub, would be retaken by Dominion forces in only a few short months. For me, I think the perfect ending to this episode would have been with Sisko standing in the devastation, looking all around him. And as he looked, his communicator would come to life with Worf. Worf would say the Defiant and Veracruz had arrived, and troops were now being transported down to hang on. Help was on the way. Sisko would thank Mr. Worf and then sigh. He would state, We held. And Reese behind him would say, Those were our orders, sir. Fade to black. Larkin, Nadia, former commander AR-558, killed in action, 2375. Vargas, lieutenant, junior grade, Security Officer, AR-558, killed in action, 2375. Kellen, crewman, engineer, AR-558, killed in action saving Esri Dax, 2375. McGreevy, rank unknown, probable science officer, given color of uniform used for bandaging, killed in action assisting Vargas while wounded, 2375. Reese, lieutenant, security officer, AR-558, reassigned back to Earth, Probable counseling. 